Okay, Sarge, ready? Yep. Yes. Neil, ready? Okay, let's go first order. Six covers table 15, six pasta, yes. Six tagliatelle, six venison, six puddings. Yes, chef. Let's go. Russell, move your arse, yes? Yes, yes chef. This is not Blackpool Pier now, big boy. Let's go, yes? Yes, chef. After six, four more. Right. Come on. And why is the water not boiling? Just added it. Turn up the heat. Yep. Put some tin foil on top. Yeah, bring it to the ball rapidly. Yes, Let's chef. go. I started tonight is a very, very delicious tagatelli of wild mushrooms. And wild mushrooms this time of year is absolutely perfect because it really is now mushroom season. Service, please. Now, what's the secret behind cooking mushrooms? Cook the thicker ones first and the thinner ones later so but that the ones that have too more, much water. More importantly, let me just show you. Grab a handful of mushrooms, OK? Just a few of each mushroom. Watch the water that comes out. Yeah, it's yeah. just water. We're using a mixture of wild mushrooms, including shiitake, shirol, and trumpet de mort. The reason wild mushrooms are great is they have a much more intense flavour. OK, good. Hot pan. I soaked the mushrooms with shallots in a very hot pan to get a really good flavour. I start off with oil because butter burns too easily. Once the mushrooms start to cook, right a knob of butter finishes off the flavour beautifully. My brigade this week are Angie. Great to have her back in the kitchen, especially being a woman. This week, Angie's joined by Neil, a wee Scott in the corner, but a big talent. And, of course, I've got my right-hand man, Mark Sargent. My two commies this week are Stosey from Lancashire and Russell from Blackpool. On order, four covers table 12, four tagliatelle wild mushrooms, four venison, four rhubarb crumble. Oui. 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 No answer, Stosey. Oui. 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 Yes, chef. Yeah, come on, I want to hear you, please. Let's go now, Stozy. Pressure's on now, yes? Yep. Heat's turned up. Let's see if we can cut it. Turn that water down, cos the pasta's going to overcook in literally seconds, yeah? Yes, chef. How long, Stozy? Uh, one minute, uh, yeah, chef. Yeah, make this one the best one, sweetheart, yes? I will. Yes, Otherwise, chef. Otherwise, you're taking an early shower. Yes, chef. Russell and Stozy are just two of over 1,000 people who apply to work in the F Word kitchen. I put the best 100 through a weekend of tests and challenges to find the 12 who would make it to the restaurant. That looks like it's just come out of a dishwasher. Each week, two trainees compete head-to-head -head for a chance to win a job in one of my kitchens. Stop what you're doing! Everybody! Hello? Stop what you're doing! Each week, someone has to go home. You're going home. And you'll stay. Thank you. You are staying. <laughs> clear, clear down. Yes? Sweep the floor. But try to do it. With some cling film over your mouth. <laughs> yeah? Good, thank you. Off you go. I love you today. Tonight in the kitchen, it's Stozy. I think it tastes quite nice. She's a chef of 14 years who's never worked as part of a team. I love seeing customers or people that eat my food who seem to think it did the right thing, it hit the right spot. And joining her is Russell, a catering student from Blackpool whose parents run a Chinese takeaway. Good taste. That is actually bloody delicious. I've definitely got a lot to learn, and that's the whole reason why I've come to this competition, is because I want to learn from the best people. You tasted it? Yes, Chef. Yeah, and? I think it's OK, Chef. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pasta's overcooked. Stop. Right. Taste it. If you don't know that now, you should right. be in a kitchen. You know that. Right, Chef. Pasta's like glue. It's right. not even... It's got no bite to it. It's lost its... It's greasy. It's, it's yes, not chef. good. Start again. Right away, yeah. Yeah. Start again. Take the mushrooms out. Four more tagliatelle. Come on, okay. Russell, please. The pasta goes in at the last minute. Even from yes, the chef. heat of the mushrooms helps to cook the pasta even more. Yes, so chef. it should be dipped in there. Your hand should leave the basket in, out, into the mushrooms. Yes, chef. I know not everyone has time, but pasta dough is really easy to make. Just combine flour, eggs and olive oil in a food processor. Remove and knead for about two to three minutes until the dough is smooth and elastic. Wrap in cling film and chill for at least half an hour. The secret behind making good pasta is not allowing it to dry out, so you have to really move your ass. Right, uh, Stozy and Russell, let's go. First thing we have is a nice floured table. Roll the pasta just to take a little bit of the sort of weight off the pasta machine. So we just get it a little bit thin so it starts to go through the machine, OK? and let the machine do the work. Every time it goes through the machine, it goes down a number. Yeah? Now, to cut it, fold it nice and neatly, but while we fold it, we just sprinkle it with flour. Here we go, up and round, and then from there. Nice long length, pasta. 
look at where we are. You don't really want any longer than that because you've got to think of the customers pulling it yeah. from their bowl. So let's go there, shall we? Okay. Yeah? Take the telly, one piece through, back of the hand, in the machine. Yes? Up. And look, here it comes. It's almost like going to the hairdresser, isn't it? That nice fringe. Let those little bits dangle off and then dry on to there, yes? There we go. Let's go. Nice. Very nice. The most important thing about the presentation with the tagatelli of mushrooms is get your tongue and twist the tagatelli round so it almost shapes a really nice ball in the centre of the plate. Then get your wonderful sautéed mushrooms oozing of garlic and shallots and just let them sort of fall on top of the tagatelli. But the secret is to make sure the tagatelli is not all broken up, just like that, nice and relaxed. Parmesan cheese on there, quickly. Yes, chef. Let's go, Stozy. Uh, move over, that's it. Yeah. No, there you go. Got to be on your toes in the kitchen, you know that? Yes, chef. Yeah, you're heavy-footed, like a little baby elephant running around. Clump, 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 clump. Go, table two, please. Go. Go, 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 go. Four tagliatelle, how long? After that, four more tagliatelle away, please. Hello. Hello. How was the tagliatelle of wild mushrooms? It's very nice. We need a bit of seasoning. A little bit more seasoning. Yeah. I thought it tasted amazing. The pasta, the mushrooms, the garlic, the herbs, unbelievable. All oh, so many tastes in one go. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. Very nice. I wouldn't attempt it myself, but it was uh, it was very good. Nothing was overpowering, but you could taste every individual ingredient. It was really beautiful. Next on the menu, along with our main course of venison with chocolate sauce. I poisoned my best friend. The campaign continues to get women back in the kitchen. Tell the neighbours, the kitchen's been used! <laughs> and more fun down on my farm. No, no, no more, no more. We're going to start cooking now, guys, yes? Clean out that pan, yes? Welcome back to the F Word, the food show that's good enough to eat. Next up is the roasted venison on a bed of creamy cabbage with a red wine sauce finished with bitter chocolate. OK, so you, with, you understand what's going on, yes? Chef, yeah. Yeah, you've got four in, yes. plus six is ten. Yes. Now I want five. Yeah. One, one of those one five is for the food critic. Good yes, girl, chef. let's go. Get rid of the fat in there, please, yeah? Yeah. Let's go, in the oven. Venison's not just for posh people like Giles. You can buy it in supermarkets, so go on, try it at home. A lot of people get a little bit worried about venison because they think it's sort of very gamey and very strong, but it's not. Salt, pepper. Hot pan, olive oil. Seal. Butter. Base. Butter paper. It protects the venison. Keeps it really nice and moist. Nothing's drying out. They are the perfect chef blanket. Hot oven, eight minutes. Red wine, chocolate sauce. Pancetta, shallot, garlic. Be quite generous with the black peppercorns because we need to wake the sauce up a bit. Thyme, bay leaf. 350 mils, red wine. The red wine gives it body, texture, and a real nice depth of flavour. Reduce. 350 mils brown chicken stock. Reduce. Quite beautiful. Sieve. Then a little dash of raspberry vinegar. Dark chocolate. Delicious sauce. Mm. Don't slice it too thin. Slightly pink in the centre. Loin of venison with red wine chocolate sauce. Done. The combination of chocolate and red wine may sound a little bit weird, but they really do go well together. And it's very rich, so you don't need a lot of it. 
When grating the chocolate into the sauce, whisk it in gently, but be sure not to boil the sauce, otherwise there's a possibility that it will curdle. If it does start to curdle, then change pans quickly into a cold pan to bring the sauce back together. OK, with the venison, we're going to serve a cream cabbage, yes? Yes, sir. OK, so it's cabbage with celeriac, carrots yep. and pancetta. And the celeriac gives it a little bit of sort of... It yeah, makes it sort of taste almost like the garden. You know, it's a root vegetable, yeah. it's grown underneath, it doesn't see any sort of daylight, so it's all underground. So the flavour is extraordinary, yeah? Okay? The vegetables and pancetta need brisk frying for four to five minutes before adding the cream. And we go around the outside oh. of the pan. Okay, all the way around. So by the time it hits the centre, uh -huh. yeah, uh -huh. it's all nice and thick. That is a dish on its own, let alone the venison to go on top. Into your bowl. Creamy winter cabbage with slerac. OK? Good. OK, Angie. Six venison here. Stozy. Six on there, please, yes? After that, you follow by four, yes? Sauce, please. That's nicely cooked there, uh, Ange. Nice and pink. Sauce, please. Come on, Russell. Automatic now. Come on. Think about it. Come on. Go, please. That six you just sent there were the best. Come on, let's go. Yes? Did you enjoy your starter? It wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It was, it was lovely. It was cold plates, though. There's someone's got to be fired in there. If it cooled down a little bit, I like it. Piping hot would have been nicer for here. So how's the campaign going to get women in the kitchen? Campaign's going fantastically well. Good, good. To the extent that 2,000 women applied for my help, but there was one woman who stood out from the rest. She didn't even know where the kitchen was. Kieran's a professional rugby player, so his diet is really important to how he plays and how he trains and I don't really help him in that area at all. Mm, good to see you. Nice to meet you. One thing I hate the most, that's him having one over on me. So, And the cooking thing is the only thing he's got on me at the moment, so if I can match him in that area, we're going to be pretty equal. Now, you look immaculate, manicured and sort of almost like you've never broken sweat. You're probably right. The fingers are soft, <laughs> nails are just immaculate. Yeah? Yeah. Tell me, why can't you cook? Everything seems to go wrong for me when I cook. I either undercook things, overcook things, get all the timings wrong. Just nothing ever seems to work out for me in the kitchen. She's cooked one or two meals. And worst disaster? Uh, worst disaster, putting one of her friends in hospital. I poisoned my best friend. You poisoned your mate? I did, by giving her uncooked chicken. And she spent two days in hospital. Oh, my goodness me. So today, we've got all the rugby players coming around for lunch. I'm trying to think of something that is simple. Yeah. Sophisticated mm -hmm. and something that can sort of serve a large table. Okay. Yeah? And something that can help get your confidence going in the right direction. And it is just a good old fashioned fish pie. Oh my God. I've never ever touched raw fish. There you go, nice handful full of prawns. What do they feel like? <laughs> Disgusting! God dear, oh dear. You see, what I'm trying to do is get you dirty. You I'm dirty just... enough. <laughs> right. There you go. Okay. All I want you to do is just take the salmon. Cut it in half. Watch your fingers there. Right. Into nice big long lines. And then from there, and that's a dice. I, I hate it if Kieran's like better at something than I am. So. That's quite healthy, that, the fact that it's competitive, you know that? Definitely. He would be so surprised if he came home from training and there was a stunning meal sitting on the table. That's fish stock. Right. Really good. Healthy fish stock. Okay. What does that need in there? Salt. Yeah, good. Let's put half it in there. Okay. Give it a little stir. Now, we don't want to stir it too much. What happens if we stir it rapidly? What happens to the fish? The fish is just going to break up. Break and crumble. <laughs> Flip an egg, you've just started to sweat. <laughs> Hold it down and toss. That's it. There, good. Good. So now we've got two things going on at once. Great. Yeah, you're serving off the mushrooms, you're cooking off your fish. Yep. Flip, what's that? Smoke alarm. Smoke alarm. Has it ever gone off before? No. Flipping egg. There's hallelujah. <laughs> Way. Tell the neighbours the kitchen's been used. <laughs> the kitchen's been used. 
Okay, great. Good. Try and get the salmon yeah. throughout the dish so it's really nice and look. There's nothing worse than having a pie that's missing filling. The nice thing about this, we don't need to season it. Why don't we season it? Because we've seasoned it throughout. Exactly. Okay. The smell of that. You know, we haven't even finished cooking it yet. It smells great. A nice tip when you're not too sure is just dust your top. Yeah. Put that down. There's your mark. Yeah, it's almost like creating a little football pitch. Look, there you go. Now you know what size to roll to. And if you want the width, one there, one there. There you go. That's where you've got to stick Perfect. with it. A bit further up, because you'll be short. There, right there. Good. Look at the colour of those fingernails. Oh, God. what happened? There's flour, there's salt, there's salmon, there's monkfish, there's cod, there's peas, there's onions, there's parsley, there's stock in there. OK. Lights on, and hopefully they're going to rise. Just turn that up a little bit. <laughs> they're here. When was the last time you had ten big dudes like that sat at the table? I've never had that many people sat around my table. Be careful not to destroy the pastry. Okay. I'll leave that one in there cooling down. Okay. Stacy's fish pie. <laughs> this one's for you, Dawes. Kieran, happy? Very happy. Stace, happy? I'm really happy. Do you remember we said about the competitive streak earlier? Yes. I think I've matched him. Highly competitive. Uh, cheers. Um, wasps. I mean, sorry, London <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. How are you? Good to see you. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Have you done anything? I have. You have changed my life. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Oh, babe. <laughs> huh? uh, what have you cooked? I've cooked a roast dinner. Serious? Chicken pie. Chicken pie as well as a roast lunch. Kira's pretty chuffed, to be honest. Serious? Yeah. Um, good or...? Yeah, brilliant. It's brilliant. She now thinks that cooking's not just a household chore. It's kind of like she enjoys it, so... <laughs> happy all right. Guys, it's really important, OK, that hopefully you'll go back to your kitchen, you go back to your kitchen, and you'll go back to yours and do some cooking, surely. I was hoping you'd go and see my, uh, my girl and uh, give her a few lessons as well. <laughs> you want me to go around and see your lady and help her go... Uh, <laughs> <come Well>, cooking. <laughs> I think you <laughs> should do some cooking for lessons. her, no? Yes. Yeah, you know, I'm really pleased the fact that you've got the confidence back, you're cooking, and you feel really comfortable with it. That's so important. I'm just more confident in the kitchen. That's great. Now, when's the next England match coming up? It's got the first game against Australia, I think it is, so yeah. it's uh, exciting times again. So we stuff them with a the cricket. Please give it to them from behind again for the rugby, yes? And then after a successful match, round to Madam's here for <laughs> chicken pie, fish pie, roast lunch. I yes. Can do it all. Good luck. <laughs> Keep it up, please. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks Thank for coming, you. guys. Good luck. Well, well done, Stace. Stace. Keep it up. <laughs> Charles. Gordon. Is it, is it really true that 2,000 women responded to your campaign? Uh, I don't yeah, believe that. Yes, it's true, but it's actually over 2,000. You know that. But what shocked me more is the 70 women that asked you out for a date. They didn't. Yeah. Why keen. did they want to do that? Yeah. Have they got no pride? <laughs> <laughs> you clearly think they don't. 70 women. Yeah, it's very strange. Let me just introduce you to some. Put that in. I don't know if I should do this. Hi, Giles. My name's Nikki. I'm 28 years old and a classical pianist. I'm looking for someone who's creative, with zest for life. If I could cook for you, it'd be roasted fillet of beef with porcini and loads of herbs wrapped in parma ham. And we'd finish with a rich dark chocolate cake with raspberry coulis, fresh mint and only one spoon because we'd be sharing. Charles, my name's Sam. I'm 38. I'm a director of sales for a hotel consultancy Mrs Robinson. Company, and I'm looking for someone spontaneous and who doesn't take themselves too seriously, who hopefully shares my love of food. No, they're not in public. <laughs> Hi, Charles. My name's Kit. <laughs> No, it is embarrassing. I'm looking for someone articulate, intelligent and sexy. Uh, this is not what I signed up for. I thought it was a classy food show. <laughs> if I were to cook for you, it would probably be my very special smoked fish pie with a rich, creamy, buttery sauce. <laughs> <laughs> there were only three of them, though, weren't there? There weren't 70. Can I see the other 67? <laughs> not that there was anything, because they were really lovely. Now, you've clearly been a big hit with the women watching. Are you sure your sperm counts up to it? <laughs> Are you taking the piss? <laughs> well, I wasn't sure, which is why I'm going to have it tested. Chefs have a genuine reason to having a low sperm count. Why? Are they... Where you stand in the kitchen, you're very close to the stove, and the heat that's generated from the stove is not good for the old testes. My word, it cooks them. So have you you've got a low sperm count? I will admit, between you and I, yes, I do have a low sperm count. 
He's got a low sperm count. Yeah. However, he may have a lot of restaurants, but he got no sperm. It's fired three times and worked four. <laughs> This week I've been worrying about my sperm count. As everybody knows, sperm counts are down due to diet, due to environment, due to all sorts of things. Men are seeking fertility treatment more often than women. Uh, men are in all sorts of trouble all over the Western world, emasculated, depressed, doomed. What can we do about it? As a food person, I want to know, can I change the way I eat to improve my sperm count and give me a better chance of creating future generations? To find this out, I'm going to go head to head in a challenge for manliness with Gordon. And Gordon is a hamster. Now, according to recent statistics, this hamster, on average, is likely to have a higher sperm count than me, pound for pound, or, or more likely ounce for ounce, or fluid ounce for fluid ounce. What I want to find out is if I change my diet radically, and Gordon is free to change his, can I boost my sperm count and beat him in a test of virility? I think Giles has set himself an enormous task. Uh, hamsters' testicles are about a quarter of their body size, and they produce far more sperm than the average man these days. Uh, men of over f the last 50 years, men's sperm count has dropped dramatically. So, for my money, I I'm on the hamster. Right, so it's the moment of truth now. It's the fertility clinic. I'm going to make my deposit, uh, and then this specialist is going to tell me what lies in future for me. Uh, a sticky version of palm reading, basically. Right, thank you. Gosh, I do hope I can deliver under all this pressure. <laughs> Doing it in the bog. This is terrible. Can't I go in the ladies? The very least, the sort of frisson, the whiff of perfume in the air. Well, I, I don't really know what I was worrying about there. It's uh, the old magic is still there. Hi, Giles. I've got the results. Eight out of ten, but they could be ten out of ten. Oh, really? Yeah. Count 64 million, so that is really, really good. In terms of um, motility, very, very good. Vitality, 73%. That's like an egg, 73%, <laughs> isn't it? Now, the one area that is OK but not brilliant, which is borderline, is morphology. And what the morphology shows is the shape and the structure of the sperm, OK? And yours is 14, which is borderline, which means it's on the lower side. Borderline. Borderline. That little hamster is not going to get the better of me. So next week, I'm going to be in the studio with Zeta, finding out what I can cook up to improve my sperm count. You will die childless, my friend. I will father generations. That's more than I ever need to know about Giles Corrin's tadpoles. Next on the menu, pudding's not looking too promising. Chris, when it's brown, it's cooked. When it's black, it's I almost make my favourite French frog croak. <laughs> it's awful. It's disgusting. And the children have to face a harsh reality on the farm. If the medicine doesn't work, Gary is going to have to be put down. <laughs> Welcome back to the F Word. Right, Stozy, four nice letters and they were lovely, yeah? Beautifully cooked. To be a great commie in a brigade, not only do you have to be passionate, but you have to be willing to work harder than most people do in their entire lives. You understand what's going on, yes? You got four in, yes. plus six, then I want five more in. I sent Giles Corrin, our resident slacker, to go and spend a day in one of my restaurants to see if he really does have a full day's work in him. A working day for a commie here starts at 8 a.m. and ends at midnight. The starting salary is a magnificent 14,000 a year. Right, well, I've got to the Connaught. I'm going to go in and meet Angela Hartnett and the team and find out just what it takes to be a chef in a Gordon Ramsay restaurant. And for me, a complete first, I'm going in through the tradesman's entrance. Hello. So, uh, how many are in today, then? Full? Um, full for lunch, and we've got about 150 tonight. Right, that goes like that. You're not <laughs> Gordon. I'm presuming as a restaurant critic, you know what this is. I don't know, it's like a white radish or something. So, well, it's, it's basically the artichoke family, salsify. You're basically going to peel the whole lot down in lemon water. This? All yes, of Yes, all of this. This is just one of about 20 jobs you've got today. My doom in the shape of a shallot. Each week, Angela and her team chop 4,000 onions. They produce 15 gallons of soup and serve a total of 2,000 meals. Yeah, I feel joyous that Giles is in the kitchen because it's sort of a little revenge on critics, you know. They'll suddenly realise how hard it is and how tough it is. And, they can sit up there and go, yeah, it's easy, they haven't done this, they haven't done that, but actually come in the kitchen and do it. You know, do a full day's graft, you know, with the pressures that you have to do day to day, and then tell me that we don't, we know, you know, we're not infallible, we're not the Pope for crying out loud. Yeah, 
your next job is uh, fish bones. Like really? I said, it's all the out. Fish know, bones? Really. You're gonna I have to them. say, these fish, these fish look the way that I feel. Get rid of all the gills and take out the gut. The Connaught serves 500 portions of fish a week. That's a thousand eyes some terrible, bloodthirsty sod has to gouge out. This is, the, this is so dis... I'm never going to eat in a restaurant again. It'll be a film critic. We basically put him on rolling croissants, because if you can't manage fish, you should be able to manage that, at least. What does it mean to be working for such a high-profile chef? You know, everybody wants to know what you're up to. Whenever you meet your friends, your family, they're talking about what's going on. Then I'll learn as much as I possibly can. In order to, in the future, do what? To have a nice little restaurant or country house, something like that, in York. You know, I've been peeling onions now for what feels like days, and I've got to tell you, it's not the hardest job I've ever had, but I'm losing the will to live. Right, let's go, Giles. Wait, oh, off. Come on, I've got a yeah. hundred and thingy to get for lunch yeah. and you're pissing around. Let's go, you. Move. Can you speed up a bit? You're in service now and you're basically in everyone's way. Two duffel lamb and a venison, yeah? After that, we come back to 29. Lamb is your cotton and monkfish, yeah? Drain off the fat, so basically go around there, get a chinois, drain it off. He's, he's quite appalling. I think, you know, he's very slow, you know, he's not methodical, he doesn't work tidy, so you've got to be honest, really, you know. If he'd done a t trial today, he wouldn't have got a job. Blimey, it's daylight. Fair, fair point, Gordon. Uh, it's hard work. I smell of onions and fat like an old hot dog. I wouldn't do it again in a thousand lifetimes. It seems that the world is full of ambitious young boys and girls who think that working for you is a privilege, but I am not one of them. OK. Uh, first of all, I can't believe you fell asleep in Angela's kitchen. Never seen that before in my life. If a man needs a kip, a man needs a kip. In, in, in my life, when I want to sleep, when I'm tired, I go to sleep. Not in a kitchen, Giles. Well, I didn't ask to go in that stupid kitchen. It was your idea. You were trying to prove a point that I couldn't hack it. I had a kip. And I, I wanted you to do a full day's work, that's all. Just get in there and sweat and graft and understand. If that I wanted to do a full day's work, I'd food. get a proper job, wouldn't I? Serious. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it in a way. I tried to enjoy it. I tried to whistle while I worked, and Andrew was going, Who's whistling? Stop whistling. I mean, what kind of a workplace is that? It's like a prison. So, Stozy and Russell back there, OK, are busting their nuts off. Yeah. Do you understand exactly what they're going through now? I certainly do. If one of them had learned the principle of heating up a plate, it might have even been more. Oh, you're, you're never happy, are you? But I can make sure the plates are in the oven. Yeah, back in the kit. Oh. Back in your box. Right. Right, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, how are we? Good, thank yes. you. Yes? Yeah. How was your venison? Really nice. Yes, not too rich? Uh, no, I've never had it before and it was really tasty. And what do you think of the idea with the chocolate sauce and the venison? It didn't taste like venison, it did taste like game. It was very soft and subtle and it tasted very much like beef, but it was, it was a lovely blend of flavours. It was strong enough but not overpowering as you'd expect game to be and it was, it was lovely. It, everything worked really, really well and it was just done just perfect. It melted in the mouth, loved it. I've eaten venison before, but nothing that was ever resembled this. And it's not just flattery because you know, I'm being interviewed here. It, it, it really is. It, it was absolutely wonderful. Beautifully, I'd love to know how he'd done it. Now it's time for pudding. Each week on The F Word, a guest tries to beat me with their recipe for a pudding. Today, it's Christopher Parker with his rhubarb crumble. If he beats me, his dish will be served to the F-word diners. I think my rhubarb crumble will beat Gordon's because it's just going to be simple. It's going to be a nice traditional recipe that my nan's cooked for years, my mum's cooked for years, I've cooked for years, and I'm really good at. And um, people like that. People don't like stuff too fancy. We have a bit of custard on the top. Great. Right, Christopher, how are you? Very well. How are yes? You? Good. Now, what's the secret behind the crumble? You must have one ingredient um, up your sleeve that's going to sort of help taste it, help make it taste better. Demerara sugar to make it crunchy. Yes. Caster sugar to make it sweet. Uh huh. Chilled bowl. Yep. So that the butter doesn't melt too much. Okay. Very technical there with the yeah. old hands. You look a little bit like Gary Rose. That Thanks. orangutan. This is a very straightforward rhubarb crumble, except we're going to saute the rhubarb off in some fresh vanilla, finish it with a little bit of butter, and then just slightly sprinkle it with sugar so it makes a bit of a caramel. And what are you putting on top of your uh, crumble, Chris? Um, I think I'm going to go for an old favourite that yep. everyone likes um, custards. What are you putting on? No, I'm just going to serve it with some mascarpone, lemon mascarpone. Lemon mascarpone? Yes, just something a little bit sort of, I suppose, not as rich as custard, but something a little bit lighter. I don't think my nan's going to like yours, you know. This crumble mix is actually quite interesting because we've got some hazelnuts in there, some oats, some flour, demerara sugar, and then just a very light sort of 
lemon zest in there, just to make it a little bit more vibrant, a little bit sort of easier to eat. Um, one of the tricks of my nan is to keep everything cold. So um, keep your fingertips cold before you knead the butter, and also the bowl has to be chilled. But then it can get moist, so if you wipe it with a tea towel, then it's not moist. Then the butter doesn't kind of go into a paste. It, you can still keep it into a crumble, because sometimes um, if things are warm, then it gets a bit too soppy. This is a pickled ginger. And this ginger here is more associated with when you're eating sushi. But it's actually quite sort of light in pickle, and um, it's got rid of that sort of rawness, and it's not so sweet. Um, Chris? Yeah? It's burning. Oh, um, yeah. Can we get some more rhubarb, yeah. please? And Chris, something that we always remember in a kitchen. Yeah? When it's brown, it's cooked. When it's black, it's... The hobs are like industrial hobs, they're too hot. Now it's the hob now, yeah? yeah? Nothing to do with Nana, nothing to do with your lack of concentration, now it's the hob. Well, it's your fault, you keep talking. What was the food like um, in EastEnders, in that calf? Oh, it was awful. Was it really? It was awful, yeah. Who was the chef? Well, the, uh, the props guys used to cook the food. Oh, really? Um, and to all their credit, they were quite good, but obviously, if they cooked it like half an hour before, it could be cold. Yeah. I'm just going to put the final topping on top of the rhubarb. And it's actually quite interesting because the oats absorb more of the juice than it would be if it was just sort of flour and butter. And the butter gets it really nice and crispy, and the oats just start to absorb all that flavour from the rhubarb. And how long for Nana's recipe? Um, maybe about 10 minutes at the most. 10 minutes, OK. Yeah. Did you take this long learning your lines? No. No. Look at that. Nice, homemade, normal rhubarb crumble. Bring it over. I always like to compare them just yeah. before they go in the okay, oven. Okay, well, let's put them together. Bit of a chef's thing. Now. Yours looks like bird seed. Okay. Or cat litter. Cat litter. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think mine looks nice, you know, old fashioned. If you know that, you haven't tasted it yet, yet you're slagging it off. Chris. Yeah, I know. But I think mine's going to taste better anyway because it's got odd ingredients in it. Right, ready? Yeah. Here we go, big boy. Oh, good can luck, have, by the way. Can I have the um, top shelf? You can have whatever shelf you Thank wish. You. I'd like to wish you the best. No, it's just luck thing, and yours looks awful. Hello, mate. Hi, mate. How are the turkeys doing? It's been a bloody tough week, you know that. Is it? Poor fellows. They're, they're not well. Gary, not well. That abscess has grown. It's not as easy to live the good life as I thought. We're fattening up six turkeys for Christmas dinner. But one of them, Gary, has got an abscess on his foot. Peter the vet has been giving him antibiotics. OK, now, we've got to get this down his throat. The syringe has to go right down the back of his throat, there, and give it a squeeze. OK? There's his mouth. Let him swallow. There's he swallowed. Do you see him swallow? Oh, wow. Good boy. <laughs> oh, I can't believe my daughter's kissing Gary. Joking aside, it's time for the kids to face a harsh reality. If the medicine doesn't work, mm -hmm. Gary is going to have to be put down. While the children wait for news of Gary, they've been helping me in the garden. I'm growing fresh seasonal vegetables to go on the plate with the turkey. I'm determined my kids will grow up knowing where their food comes from, unlike one in three kids who don't even know what chips are made of. What's that? No, in Italian, Italian. No, Cavernero. Cavernero. Right, let's start again then. Let's start again. What's this one? Beetroot. What's that one? Leeks. Leeks. Cavernero. Cavernero. One more time. Cavernero. Okay, this one. Cavernero. But the missus isn't as happy with the farm. It's wet, it's muddy, the turkeys have begun to smell a bit, even though they're regularly cleaned out, and the kids just get caked in everything, and it, it's not great. Um, they're shitting everywhere. Um, the garden's an absolute mess. I have to say, I think the honeymoon period is over. It stinks. How can I get rid of that smell? Probably what would be a good idea to try is if we spread straw on this area for now and yep. keep it dry. Yeah. Um, it'll enable the birds to walk about on dry ground. Um, what about put them out in the garden and let them spread their wings a bit? I think it's much better that these birds are allowed out and yep. give them some freedom, let them yes. have a walk around. Don't tell Mummy, OK, please? Mummy <laughs> saw! Oh, no. I told you. So what's the latest on bird flu? There are no directives from DEFRA, the people who organise all of this. Um, at the moment because we don't have bird flu here, so free-range birds are quite, uh, quite happy to be out. There's no problem there.
So you're more than confident that we'll still have free-range turkeys on the table on the 25th of December? Yes, absolutely. There'll be free-range birds um, in the supermarkets for Christmas, unless the situation gets any worse. Mm -hmm. That's good news. Absolutely. Right, come here. Yeah. We're going to dry their pens out. We're going to scatter the pen, OK, with some straw. We'll get all the straw like this, yeah? <laughs> Come here. <laughs> this is, this is... <laughs> Megan, no, no. <laughs> oh, no, no more. No more. I think they look happy, don't you? Yeah, but my back's so no more locking Your what? My back's so itchy. Your back, we shouldn't throw hay around everywhere. Come here. But I should throw hay on me. I didn't throw it, it dropped you on you. No, you threw it on me. Right, listen, just tell Mummy, OK? She slipped over it. Don't tell Mummy. No, I'm going to tell her that what really happened. No, 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 listen, yeah. listen, listen. Some sweeties? Yeah! Gary definitely seems to be more comfortable on the straw, and he's been on antibiotics for a week, so it's time for Peter to make a decision about whether he's going to pull through or will he have to be put down. Hi, Gordon. What do you say, Peter? Hi. Um, right, he's been on the painkillers. He's had antibiotics. He's clearly not eating. And it's Peter's decision Unfortunately, whether or not Gary stays with us, Jack, till Christmas, or we're going to have to put him down. So, Peter, what do you think? Well, I've had a look at him today walking around, but I just want to have a look at his foot one more time. Yep. If you remember, the base of his foot was quite swollen. Yes. Um, and that's the important thing. Oh, look. And that's softened now. It's not as swollen at all. Uh -huh. This joint is working quite well. And um, when I was watching him walking earlier, he was walking really well. So the good news is, I think he's made it. And I think we'll take him off the antibiotics and hopefully we're there. Okay? Happy? Yes? All right. Gary's staying with us. Yeah! Okay. yeah. <laughs> Gary's going to be with you for Christmas. Yeah. So you've got a turkey for Christmas, yes? Yeah! Well, I have a little taste of mine, yeah? Okay. And I'll have a little taste of yours. Because I'm dying to taste it. But do you know what? I'm going to taste it without the custard, uh, Christopher. Oh. It's not bad. Okay. Two out of ten. Good luck. Good luck, my man. Yeah. Yes. It's time for our rhubarb crumbles to be judged, and it's my reputation on the line. So far, it's one win to the guest cook. <laughs> oh, get out. <laughs> and one win to me. Mum, I'd never have won had you not taught me properly, know that. <laughs> but I should win hands down to this young upstart. We've chosen our judges from tonight's diners, and all that matters is taste. <laughs> Ow. Nice bit of cinnamon in there, though. Like that. That's good. I don't know why. I think I can taste lemon juice, but really? maybe Ooh. maybe it's not. Maybe it's just the combination, but... It's not quite tart enough. This is your dish number two. This is totally the reverse. It's not quite as sweet, either. It's got a nice little touch to it. It's got to be dessert number two. Number two. Dessert two. So I have to say the winner is this week. Yes. Well done, Gordon. Yes! What? Congratulations. Yes. Well done. I I'm did... devastated. No, don't be devastated. Three out of three. My nan's not going to be happy. I'm gutted. Um, I didn't like his rhubarb crumble. I don't... It was all right, but it doesn't taste like rhubarb crumble. Mine tasted like good old-fashioned rhubarb crumble. I think those blind tasters, oh, I don't think they were tasting it. I think they got mixed up somehow. But what's even worse is that all three of them chose Gordon's and didn't choose not even one of them like mine. Next on the menu, it's a treat from Scotland. It's like something out of an alien film. And we find out which commie will be back and which one will be going home for good. So the person I'd like to keep in the brigade of the F-word... <laughs> Time to find out what our guests thought of their pudding. Delicious. Really nice. Um, fruity flavours. Nutty top bit. It was bitter. It was gritty, nutty. I don't like nuts. <laughs> Perfect. Ends the three course meal. Delicious. Now, um, you're a bit of a food connoisseur, right? I pretend to be, yeah. yeah. I don't tell anyone I'm not. You've sort of almost tasted everything on the planet. Within reason. Well, I actually think I've beaten you now. No. Yeah? I've tasted something you haven't tasted. Can only be a vegetarian lasagna. Not quite. Better than that. Gannett. 
We're in a very remote and inhospitable part of the British Isles, right in the very northwest tip of Scotland, just above the Outer Hebrides, in search of something unique, a delicacy called gannet. A seabird that's notoriously greedy, the gannet is actually a protected species. The islanders of Lewis are the only people in the UK who are allowed to kill and eat these birds. But they're under pressure from the animal rights lobby, and it's probably my last chance to taste this bird. Maybe we're in search of a gannet. <laughs> what a delicacy. What do they taste like? Oh, amber nectar. Amber nectar. Sol salty duck. Uh -huh. Fishy duck. Fishy salty duck. Fishy salty duck. This is the rarest bird ever, and I haven't tasted one. I'm I've been cooking for 20 years and I'm dying to get hold of this thing. There's got to be somewhere I can get hold of one. Well, uh, you're probably going to have to try Sweeney. Hi, Gordon. Yes. Hi, I'm Sweeney. Sweeney? I understand you're looking for some cougar. It's illegal to buy or sell gannet, or googa, as it's known locally. But Sweeney was born in Lewis and he has offered me one of his birds from this year's cull. Having eaten nearly everything there is to eat in this world, yeah. I've never, ever had the chance to come across this delicacy. Well, I'll say to you now, it'll be an experience. The islanders salt cure the gannet, which only adds to its overpowering smell. So Sweeney keeps his in the garage, not a good sign for something I'm about to eat. God, the smell! What have you done to it? It's just how it is. Jesus Christ almighty. It's like something out of an alien film. Tastes good, though. Oh, God. Look at the fat on it. Yeah. And that's been in there for how long? Uh, less than two weeks. Really? But what's in that liquid? Just salt. So it's almost like a brine? Aye. And this is the delicacy. That I've travelled hundreds of miles. Aye. Across sea and land to look at this. Worth your while, isn't it? Oh, God's sake. Sweeney's no cook, so he sends me off to find someone whose traditional gannet recipe has been handed down for generations. Go find Miriam. That's for you. For me? Because apparently you know exactly what to do. So you're going to quarter it first? Yes. It doesn't look very appetising. Traditionally, this was cooked as well, but I, I take this off. The feet. One, two. Three, four. There we go. And that's it. You boil it for an hour and 20 minutes to an hour and a half. No salt, no pepper. No salt, no <laughs> pepper, no nothing. Just <laughs> pure and adapted to water. Sneak a bay leaf in there or something. Put no, a sprig of thyme not in a there. hole. Not a hole. Not a hole. The thought of somebody doing something like putting a wine sauce or something like that on it. Oh my God, you know. The cooking smell is rank. Patty, hell. <laughs> That's worse than rotten eggs, then. No, it's not at all. It's How long does that linger for? That, I mean, can you to tell? tomorrow, anyway. To tomorrow. Right, let's see if this thing's cooked. There we are, it is. Wow. Well, it smell off. It doesn't smell as strong now as it did when it first started see? cooking. I told you. Fascinating. Yes, Having seen how it's cooked, I'm dreading eating it. <laughs> That's incredible. It's, it's, it's so fishy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's absolutely it's incredible. It's a cross between a sort of yes, tuna fish. stroke mackerel mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and venison. <laughs> and and with, a, with a meaty flavour. God, it's quite refreshing. I didn't think it would be that tasty, you know that. He told you. So here you go. The meat is delicious. I'm not that keen on the fat. No, it's quite, no, the, the fat's an acquired taste. Yeah, that's quite it. sort of... I'd much prefer rendering it down and using it for <clears throat> heating my stove. That's <laughs> <laughs> the fat, that's the meat. That's the meat. I've asked Marianne to come to London to share her recipe with the F-word diners. Let's take it to our food critic, see what he's got to say, yes? Uh -huh. Here we go. Now, this is a rare delicacy, yeah? Have... Have a wee bite of something historical. Now, don't move away like that. Taste oh, it, come on. It smells of pickled uh, pickled fish. It's um, a very... It tastes slightly of snake, doesn't it? Snake? Taste a, taste a bit of this one here. No, no. No, <laughs> no, because that's, that's a joke, isn't it? What is that? It's not a joke. For God's that? sake, man, stop being paranoid. Have a taste. What is it? The skin of the gannet. 
God almighty. <laughs> it can't be worse than a raw kebab, for God's sake. That is a delicacy. That's like, that's like sucking the pus out of a, a boil. <laughs> Come on. I'm so sorry about my friend being so rude. About I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm not a very sophisticated... Oh, I'm okay, uh, I'm yeah, okay. It's better than the venison. Jean-Baptiste, you're very cool and suave and sophisticated. Get your mouth around some gannet, young man. Yeah, get some decent... Just a wee bit. ...bird inside you. <laughs> and a bit of this one as well. <laughs> no, you got to eat together. You see, no, his on. whole thing is about being suave. Mine isn't, so yeah. he could be in trouble. Yeah, it's called Brill Cream. Come on! <laughs> <laughs> Did you take that out? Mm. No, open your hand up there. <laughs> no, put it on the floor. No, that's terrible. <laughs> you spat yeah. out a gannet. It's <laughs> awful. You eat enduillet to the inside of intestines in your... But enduillet tastes of poo, whereas this doesn't taste quite that nice.